All right, there we go. All right, welcome everybody. Um, welcome to the artist talk for the online exhibition Onward, um, featuring work by um, 2019 alumni, um, Jonathan Napini and Katie Orgozelic. Did I get that right? Close. <laughs> um, I'm so excited um, to um, have this opportunity. I wanna thank um, Professor Steve Pearson um, for giving me the chance to organize um, this online exhibition. Um, pairing these two um, for this opportunity was the, the first thing that I thought of um, when he presented the opportunity um, to me um, for a couple of reasons. Um, the first being that um, Jonathan and Katie attended um, the Maryland Institute College of Arts um, Master of Arts in Graphic Design program. Um, graduated in May of 2020. We all know what was happening in the spring of 2020. Um, so their program and their experience was very much disrupted. Um, and I wanted to give them a chance to show their thesis work that they had been working so hard on um, throughout that year. Um, so just another opportunity to show their work with um, an audience that might not have gotten the chance to see it in the first place. Um, it's also a difficult, somewhat difficult time um, to be showing work um, in the art and design realm. So this is just a chance to let their, let their work be seen. Um, and also um, a lot of research went into um, their work as well. And that's something as, a, as an instructor that I get across to my students that um, art and design is way more than just um, making stuff. There's research, there's writing, um, there's looking at other practitioners and applying that knowledge to um, your own practice. Um, and hearing directly from um, these two alumni um, will be so valuable to um, current students. Um, so um, the way that this is going to run, um, Jonathan and Katie are each going to talk about their work that's featured in the exhibition. Um, and then I'm going to ask them a couple of questions. If you have any questions that you would like um, to ask them, please put them into the chat um, and we will uh, go, go through those um, at the end or you know, however organically um, this goes. Um, so I'm gonna turn this over to um, Jonathan now and um, he will share his work. So Jonathan, I'm gonna make you the host. There we go. Hi. Well, thanks everyone for coming. So I guess in order to talk about what I ended up making, I guess I'll start with a little overview about what my project was and kind of my goals with it. So my project kind of came out of a lot of research that I've been doing for my studio practice for quite some time in a lot of my works kind of rooted in notions of space and place and kind of how I interact with particularly the spaces around me. And so this project kind of came out of some work that I was doing at McDaniel about the effects of sea level rise and climate change in the Chesapeake. And as I was considering thesis topics at MICA, I was kind of thinking about other things related to the Bay and kind of a different angle I could revisit that subject matter. And what I ended up settling on was kind of a folk history of Maryland's oyster industry through a variety of different separate elements combined together. And I kind of wanted to just paint a portrait of this way of life and kind of address why it was important to Maryland's history and just why it's something that was interesting. So I guess, let me go ahead and share my screen. I guess in order to talk about what it is that I ended up making, I first have to address what it is that I was going to make before COVID. And so my original plan for this project was to create a kind of museum style interpretive timeline wall of major events in Maryland's oyster industry and enrich that with some photographic book elements, 
a video piece and some artifacts that I was going to borrow from a local waterman. And of course, because of COVID, we couldn't have an exhibition in physical space. And so what I ended up pivoting to for the centerpiece of my project was this kind of interactive web-based timeline. And I was kind of considering, as I salvaged what I could from the physical exhibition, what some of the unique advantages that doing this in a web format would give me. And two things that came to mind was that it would slow down the way people participated in it, in it and give me a lot more opportunities for visuals. And so I ended up taking each of my elements that were going to exist on my physical timeline and adding an illustration to go with each of them. And so this piece kind of just works through this scrolling timeline format, alternating between these text pieces and illustrations. And then I also had a few of these kind of loose ended narratives that didn't really fit in with the main timeline, but that I thought were interesting and worth including. And so I included these at the end of each timeline section and delineated them by using color where everything else is black and white and photography where everything else was accompanied with illustrations. And so this timeline kind of goes through the whole history of Maryland's oyster industry and ends with a little piece about oyster farming, which I thought was kind of an interesting thing to include as a possible way forward for this part of Maryland's history to continue and survive in a sustainable way. And so in addition to this timeline element, since this was pretty text heavy and factual, I wanted to include something that was a little a little bit different paced and more of a visual statement. And so I created a couple of these very simple, minimal photo books from these really great images that I was able to source. And with these, I was kind of just hoping to create something a little bit quieter and more contemplative. And these were inspired by some books that I found in my research of this photographer, Robert de Gast, who was really pretty little known, but spent his entire career photographing life on the bay. And so I thought that those were kind of an interesting visual precedent for my work that I was doing here. And so then the final element of this project was a video piece. And I felt like because both of my other elements were pretty cold and factual, I thought it'd be interesting to kind of introduce a little bit more fun element. And so I found this really great list of slang terms used by Oystermen and chose to create this kind of whimsical animated video defining these terms. And this was actually the only piece of the project that was completely finished before COVID. And doing all of the illustrations for this video kind of inspired me to do, to use illustration when I had to pivot to a web timeline. So I guess through kind of all this disparate media, really my goals for the project were just to paint an interesting portrait of this way of life. And I guess kind of portray various aspects of it in a variety of different ways. Great, thank you, Jonathan. Um, do you wanna make Katie the host? Sure. And while we're doing that, um, either Jonathan or Katie or both of you, if you want to answer 
um, what were the specific, were there any like specific guidelines for your thesis, like things that you had to have included? Um, it was really very open-ended. Okay. Really the only stipulation was that, at least originally, we were going to have our physical exhibition in a gallery. So it just had to be something that could in some way be presented in a gallery setting. And we got a question, I think it's appropriate, um, from uh, Haley Hawkins, who says, how did you go about researching for your project? And were you able to do any in-person research? I can start. Um, yes, I did have to do a ton of research. Um, I made a children's book, which I'll explain about in a little bit. Um, but there was a lot of research that had to go behind this, such as um, learning about ch children's books because I had never written one before and didn't really know what went into it and so I had to talk to a couple of people about um, how they wrote their children's books and um, what things they thought about. So I guess for mine, my research process really kind of started at Micah's library and just a lot of surprisingly interesting books on kind of Maryland's history and things related to the topic. And then that kind of expanded into a little bit of interaction that I did have with a local waterman who's a friend of my grandfather's, who I was able to do a little bit of research with. Cool. All right, Katie. Oh, Katie, you're muted. Okay. Um, this was the title of the children's book that I created. Um, so we had to create uh, delimitations, which was basically what our thesis was not about. And um, this was pretty straightforward and just um, listed off basically anything that it really wasn't. And even if it was like so far out field, right field, it um, still counted. And then continuing into this of my research, um, Joyce Hustleberth, who is a professor at MICA. Um, she was the woman that I talked to who currently makes children's books. And she was a one person that really um, helped me create this and figure out what pieces belong and what pieces don't belong. And um, as I was starting this thesis, I had an idea of making some sort of puzzle with it because I've done puzzles so much of my life and I really love the interactive piece and I'm a visual and um, hands-on learner and so I really like that aspect of it and since it's a children's book I thought that having a puzzle along with the book would be great for younger kids um, to do and so I looked at um, Enzo Mari as some inspiration for it um, and unfortunately I didn't go through with the puzzle um, because the book was just so much work and then with COVID I had such a time crunch that I really just didn't have time to make this puzzle. Um, so yeah, I had so many children's books. Um, this isn't even, this is like just the start of all of them I had, but I checked out a ton of children's books to really see kind of the layout of what they look like and what kind of fonts or what kind of typography and um, the illustrations and um, all those um, types of things that go into a book. Katie, I still see the um, the like title page. Um, you do? Yeah, I don't see the the stack of books. So there we go. Okay, I'll just keep it like this. Okay. Um, so the storyline was one of the hardest parts for me because I had to really think of what the heck the story was going to be and I had a couple of pieces here and there but the main um, 
plot of the story. It was just, it was difficult because I didn't really know what I should have, like what should be said or what kind of characters there should be. And um, I also wanted to somehow incorporate my photography and there were just all these different factors that I had, but I just didn't know how to um, piece them together in a way that they were all cohesive. And um, so this was part of my process and I did a lot of research on um, kind of the reason why um, for choosing certain characters and where they're placed in the book and um, what kind of traits they should have. And this was really helping me to figure out how these characters were going to come alive in my book. And, and so I had a ton of animal pictures and so I decided to go with a zoo theme. And so I then had to figure out, well, what is my storyline going to be? And I had asked a bunch of people and they gave me ideas and I kind of just ran with that and um, changed things up as I went along. And so this was where I first started as, and like I said, I want to use my photography. And when I started putting it together with just the pictures and the words, it really didn't, it looked very um, flat. And so after talking with my professor, she mentioned that maybe I could somehow incorporate my photography and the illustration together. And um, I really liked that idea. And so this was, the end result that I came up with and I was really glad that I was able to um, combine those two together while still keeping the illustrations because I also really did enjoy creating that um, and then the cover was also kind of tricky because the cover is like the most important piece because it makes you what you see on it is like oh why am I gonna pick up this book to read and um, so I really had to think about the different elements that went into it and how it related to the whole book itself. Um, and then these are just some of the mock-ups that I made for my book. And that's it. So. Do you want to read the book now? Yeah. Okay. I'll read it now. Okay. Hold on. Okay. okay, it's called It's a Zoo in Here. Um, on the back it says, Gerald Giraffe has a hard time making new friends. He thinks only about the bad things he hears. Will the zoo animals help come together to help Gerald? All the zoo animal, all the animals in the zoo were gathering together to have a meeting. On the way over, Frankie Flamingo says to Boris Boar, don't be friends with Gerald Giraffe. He is way too tall. Boris Boar tells Ali Ostrich about what Frankie Flamingo told him. As Gerald Giraffe is walking over to the meeting, he overhears this and becomes sad. No one is going to want to be my, to be my friend. I am shy, super tall, and have such a long neck. Gerald Giraffe tries to join in with Ollie Ostrich, but doesn't get included. Ellie Elephant and Little Ellie greet each other by wrapping their trunks together, but Gerald Giraffe doesn't have a long neck, long trunk like Ellie. Izzy Iguana is laying on a tree limb, but Gerald Giraffe knows he is way too tall to be in a tree. Gerald Giraffe feels alone and upset. There is nothing good about me. Paul Parrot sees Gerald Giraffe all alone and asks, why are you so sad? No one wants to be my friend or include me in anything. I overheard other animals talking about my long neck. Paul Parrot says to Gerald Giraffe, 
it is okay to be different. Frankie Flamingo and you have something in common. You both have long necks. And even you and I are alike. I have bright colors on my feathers and you have pa a pattern on your, on your body. As Paul Parrott says this to Gerald Giraffe, Frankie Flamingo walks up. Frankie Flamingo says, sorry I told other animals not to be your friend. That was wrong of me. That is okay, Frankie Flamingo. Thank you for saying sorry. Paul Parrott told me that we both have something in common, long necks. Soon after, Frankie Flamingo invites Gerald Giraffe to a zoo party. I'll show you their party hats. And Gerald Giraffe feels at home at last. And that's the end. Very good. Um, we got a, we have a couple of questions that came in um, and two of them are gonna touch on um, some things that I'm gonna ask you too. Um, but we got one that said, was it difficult taking photos for the book or creating illustrations to match the photograph dimensions? Well, luckily I had all of these images or most of them, or the, most of pictures already. I did take a couple of trips back to the zoo to get a couple more images for certain animals that I needed. Um, and then for illustrations, that was pretty hard for me because this, this was really my first time creating illustrations and um, creating it in a way that just it wasn't flat and then um, just combining the two. It definitely did take some time, but um, once I got the hang of it, it was really fun to do. And um, we got another question. Did either of you start out with a different project idea before you ended up with your final idea? And I would add to that too, um, how did your project change outside, outside of like the COVID shift, but how did it develop as you were getting feedback from um, instructors, classmates, um, more research, you know, how did, how did it change and evolve? Um. What was the first question again? <laughs> um, it was, did you start out with a different project idea before you ended up with the final? Okay. Um, actually, I had so many ideas. I didn't know really what to start with. And um, after talking to my professor and um, narrowing down some ideas, like I had said, I started out with this book and then this puzzle idea and wanting to combine the two. And then once, um, after I had gotten feedback throughout this um, process, I realized that this book is going to need a lot more work and mm -hmm. this puzzle is, I'd love to do a puzzle, but at the same time, I don't think it's as important right now. And um, so I just switched to just doing my book. Cool. Jonathan, what about you? So I would say for me, I don't know that my topic exactly changed, but it did kind of evolve a lot over my research process. So when I was kind of initially approaching this topic, I was thinking about making a project just about skipjacks, which are the type of sailboat that people would traditionally use to harvest oysters. But then kind of, I realized pretty quickly that that was just too narrow and wasn't enough to build a thesis on. So then it became the oyster industry as a whole but I really spent quite a lot of time wrangling with kind of what aspects were important to include and really what I wanted to say with the project. Right. And that was something that kind of developed over some time and a lot of conversation with professors and peers. Yeah, when did those conversations start about your thesis? We got a question um, that says, um, I, that was directed towards Katie, but I think it applies to you too, in terms of you know how long did it take to put all of this together? Um, and what was the most rewarding part of the book and I think for your thesis too? Um, so I guess as far as the timeline for how all of this came together, it was really for the nature of the project, it was pretty short. We were kind of tasked at the end of our fall semester to start doing some research and come back with at least an idea or a couple of strong ideas of 
of things we might want to do with the thesis going into the spring semester. And then the project was really pretty much done by the end of March. Yeah. So it was a pretty tight timeline that we were working with. Katie, you want to add anything? Um, I forgot the question again. I'm sorry. <laughs> It was, um, what, what, what about the timing of everything? Like, when did you start this process? How long did it take to get everything put together? What were the most, what was the most rewarding part? Yeah, so when I first started, I had those two ideas. And um, as I was being told to go towards more of the book, I kind of was really stuck on where I was going to take that. And especially since I didn't know what my story was going to be. and once I did have a story and I had, I still had some pieces missing, I really struggled with figuring out, okay, well, what will go on that page and what will go on that page. And then once I um, figured it all out, it just clicked with me. And then I just made changes here and there. And um, the most rewarding part, rewarding part about this was just seeing like an actual physical book that I made and just being like, oh my gosh, that's my work. And mm -hmm. um, once COVID hit, it it didn't really, I mean, it affected me, but since I really had most of my work already like in my book form, I just had to be in communication with my professors and um, just make sure that I had it all put together. But I really love seeing this book in physical form and just holding mm -hmm. it and reading it. So mm -hmm. that's the most rewarding part. I guess I would also add as the most rewarding part for me, I think was being able to take all these kind of separate threads of my research and stories that I read and all these different aspects of the topic that I found interesting and just being able to bring them into a cohesive whole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that um, aside from the pivot um, that happened, I think with your experience your experiences here at McDaniel, um, where we do have a multidisciplinary approach to art and design, um, I'm sure that helped in some way, um, rather than having a very like strictly technical background about one sector of design or something that um, you were already equipped with um, this kind of nimble ability to problem solve based on technical skills, tools, things that you were familiar with or, or wanted to learn and had that curiosity. Um, we got a question um, and this ties into um, what I was going to ask you about, um, you know, how the pandemic disrupted that final semester. Um, you know, what was it like, and this is from um, Jan Jeanette, um, what was it like having um, to shift from using the programs and resources that are at MICA to being sent home and what you had at home because that's Micah has amazing facilities and access to any tool that you need. Um, so what was that like? I would say especially with my project since it began or not even really began but was going to be such a print heavy project that was a tricky pivot to all of a sudden not have any of the printing resources or be able to make things in physical space in the way that I was intending. I would say for me, printing was also a big thing, um, especially having a book and seeing the whole layout um, page by page instead of just looking at it online. Um, I could just print it out multiple times and then see uh, what I wanted to change, but Switching it to online was harder because a screen is different than print and I really had to make sure that my sizes for my type and um, the size of my images were uh, what it would it would make sure that it would work when I printed it out for the final. Right, and it would translate. Yeah. Um, and this is a, a great question. Um, from Steve, you know, how was the transition from undergrad um, to graduate school in terms of workload and mentoring? 
So for me, it was a pretty big uh, learning curve for me because when I started at McDaniel, the graphic design program was very minimal and I know now it's like growing a lot bigger and honestly, I wish I was taking the graphic design at McDaniel now, but um, I had some experience, but I knew that I really wanted more and I just knew that I wanted more, but I didn't know what and I knew that Micah had a lot of those resources and so um, when I started my first semester, it was pretty intimidating because it was a lot of work and it was just project after project and assignment after assignment and there were um, my different classes were all were all like on different topics and so I had to constantly think about um, branding or typography and um, thinking of what am I going to do for this project or that project and so it was really hard to kind of adjust at first but once I got the rhythm going and understanding how it all worked out together it um, went a lot smoother um, and my second semester was a lot better because um, I just I finally got the hang of it and um, luckily these classes were more geared towards our thesis so they kind of uh, gelled more together and I really relied when COVID hit I really relied on uh, communicating with my professors and making sure that I was able to talk to them or about questions that I had and um, I did a lot of that when I was at Mike as well, but when I had to go home, it was really crucial for me to um, make sure that I had that communication. And as far as mentoring, um, my peers in my class were really big inspirations for me because they all have different backgrounds. And that's another thing I really loved about Micah was we all had different backgrounds, but we're all creating on the same concepts. But all of our ideas are so different, but it's so cool to just see how so many ideas come together and um, it really inspired me and it was good to have them in this studio that I could just easily ask the person next to me a question or somebody over on the other side a question and um, yeah, it was, it was really helpful to have them. What about you, Jonathan? I would say for me, probably the biggest difference beside the work, besides the workload, which was a substantial difference, especially being a one year program, yeah. I would say was the types of feedback that I was receiving on work. I found that the feedback was a lot more, I guess, holistic in terms of talking about, I guess, more interrogating why I was making design choices that I was making and how those things influenced the project as a whole rather than talking so much about little specifics within the projects. Um, so I have a couple of questions um, too, and you've touched on, um, you know, some things, but, um, and Katie, you, you kind of just touched on this, but, um, you know, Jonathan, why did, why did you choose to pursue um, the MA program at MICA? So I guess kind of the main reason that I chose to pursue it is I really enjoyed at McDaniel how I was able to explore a wide variety of things within art and design and kind of gain a broad knowledge base. But my goal all along has been to work in industry as a graphic designer. And so I felt like doing this program would be a good way for me to enhance my skills in a few areas that I felt like I was lacking. And I chose this program in particular, well, not mostly, but a large factor being that it was a one-year program. And I really liked that I would just be able to kind of get in and get out quickly and mm -hmm. get what I needed. And I was drawn to MICA because of a lot of the interesting and notable design faculty who teach there. Um, I would say the nice mix of practical skills and design thinking that was taught in the program and a lot of the interesting opportunities for visiting artist lectures and a lot of the people they bring to campus that I think helped enrich my experience. What was your, who was your favorite visiting artist or who had the most um, impact for you? And Katie, you can answer that too. Um, I would say for me, the 
two people who had the biggest impact were during our spring semester, they brought in Margot Halverson, who's a design educator in Maine, and Nick Emmerich, who's a, I was thinking he was maybe an alumni of the program from some years ago, but who works as a designer in New York. And they really helped us about halfway through our thesis work to kind of give it a set of fresh eyes and help us really break down the key aspects of what we were trying to do with our projects and help us kind of hone that in for the second half of the semester. Cool. I would definitely agree with Jonathan. Um, they really taught or they really showed me like why was I doing this book like what was the point of it and really picking out some of the crucial pieces in my work that I was kind of missing and that I needed to really focus on and um, for example the illustrations that I had they were all solid color at the time and they said well why why a solid color why not um, maybe you should somehow use your pictures and um, why is it just the animals? Do you wanna have anything else there? And um, it really opened my eyes to things that I was missing because I was just so focused on getting the storyline in and um, making sure that it all made sense to me. Right. Were there, um, were there any cons to your experience of going to MICA outside of the pandemic disrupting everything. Um, you've talked a lot about the pros. Um, any cons? I would say probably the biggest con for me was being that it was such a short program, I felt like some of my peers who had been working out in the industry for a while had more specific goals as to mm -hmm. what they wanted to accomplish from doing the program. Whereas I kind of felt like since I went straight from McDaniel, I felt like I was spending a little bit more time kind of just exploring what was out there and the possibilities available to me. Right. And I think that kind of took up a little time. Okay. Yeah, I would agree with Jonathan again as well on that. Um, also, I would say that the MFA program there is, I think it's a year and a half. Two maybe two years but mm -hmm. it is longer and I feel like they have a lot more time to kind of explore what they really want to do and having it only be a year was kind of one just figuring out how to adjust to mm -hmm. this huge workload but also trying to learn all these skills and figure out what I want to do but I kind of just really experienced it and I'm still figuring out like what I want to do but all the experience and like was worth it. And um, what type of um, support did you have at MICA, um, you know, even pre-pandemic, but for, um, you know, professional opportunities for finding jobs, um, you know, th did you have any support um, towards the end of your time there? I would say that that is another area where I felt like MICA was a little bit lacking. Okay. They do have a career office mm -hmm. that kind of at a surface level seems to offer a lot of helpful opportunities. And they did have a pretty big and very well attended career fair yeah. where I was able to meet with a lot of potential employers. But I kind of felt like they could have done a little bit more in terms of making the office available to us. Because for example, the person in the office who was assigned to all of the both undergrad and graduate design students very quickly to, at the beginning of the spring semester just had all of her appointments booked for mm -hmm. the rest of the semester. So kind of at the time that many of us would have been hoping to start looking for jobs, yeah. the office was kind of no longer available to help us do that. That's too bad. So that was definitely a challenge. Yeah. Katie, what about you? Um, well, <laughs> jobs, um, that's We're a whole talk about story. that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but 
they do have a lot of resources. I know Micah has kind of a similar thing to McDaniel, like their handshake, um, but they have like their own program for it. And I've definitely found a bunch of uh, places there and it's really unique because it's only looking for Micah alum or like students that are at Micah right now. Um, and also like Jonathan mentioned that they were booked um, for so much of the spring semester and um, also with the job fair that they had, mm -hmm. I think it would have worked better if they had an undergrad and a grad job fair because mm -hmm. there were just so many undergrads and the lines were just forever long and yeah. um, it would have just been, I felt like it would have been better to split the two, but yeah. Yeah. I guess so, something that, um, oh, go ahead, Jonathan. I was just going to say, I guess something that they did do that I was just thinking about that was very helpful is they hosted throughout the year a lot of employer visit days where they would bring larger companies in to talk about kind of what working for them is like and how their hiring processes work and gave us opportunity to ask them questions. And okay. they were able to bring in some pretty big and high power companies. So that was interesting, even if not from a, they were necessarily hiring student standpoint, just from a seeing what options were out there. Right, right. That's just as helpful. Um, when, what, what was it like, um, you know, when everything kind of blew up in March and you have been with your um, cohort in the program and suddenly you're all virtual? Um, how did you continue to collaborate and communicate um, with each other and get feedback? And um, what was that disruption like? How did that affect, um, you know, even though you were almost done with your projects by that point, you know, how did that disrupt the rest of your time? I would say, oh, go ahead. I would say that the biggest disruption for me was that it made it such that getting feedback on the work that I was doing became a much more formalized process yeah. where when we were all working together in a studio, I could kind of just have casual conversations about what I was working on and what things were and weren't working about that. Mm -hmm. Whereas then I would say once we moved to an online format, most of my feedback was happening like in class during structured feedback sessions. Okay. I would totally agree with Jonathan and um, just the whole atmosphere was so different because mm -hmm. I wasn't in person and we were just hearing these people on screen and um, we, uh, in one of our classes that we had in the fall, our professor would have us like all lay up have us all lay our projects out on the table and we'd go around and write like our comments on each project. And um, that's one thing that we didn't get to do. And so um, mm -hmm. we really had to just rely on listening to what they had to say over screen. Right, adapting. Um, Steve asked a great question that aligns with um, what I was gonna ask next too, um, about you know what has life been like since graduating, you had a virtual graduation. Um, how is the job market in this time, um, which is certainly challenging. So if you wanna um, offer any thoughts about that and then, um, you know, if are you maintaining a creative practice, anything that you wanna um, share? I guess I can go first. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, me and Jobs um, haven't been the best of friends. Um, it has definitely been really tricky because it is just, it's been so chaotic, especially when it first started and yeah. things were shutting down and um, people didn't know what was going to happen next. And I've had a couple of interviews here and there. And um, I had a previous interview where um, it was for Baltimore Center Stage and yeah. they were looking for a graphic design apprentice. And I had the interview and then there was a bunch of talk that they might not have it and then mm. it ended up getting taken away and so that mm. was a bummer and then I recently um, like two weeks ago had an interview for like this medical company and um, I got an email last week saying that they decided to hire a full-time designer and so it's definitely been a journey and a half but mm -hmm. 
I have been taking all of it as experience of yeah. um, what is going to happen or like what might happen and know that this is how it's just going to happen and yeah. that's real life. And also I've had a couple of um, job fraud opportunities mm-hmm. and that um, really knocked me down because these opportunity seemed so real and I was super excited about it and then realized that they weren't real and I was like dang that really like sucks but I mean it's definitely been hard but I think I've been able to adapt and um, keep going so it's a hard time too yeah (laughs) yeah Jonathan what about you so for me, after graduating, I moved back to Southern Maryland just to kind of regroup and yeah. consider my options and how to move forward. And I actually was, after a lengthy job search process throughout the summer, I was actually lucky enough to a couple months ago find a job. So I'm currently working as the large format graphic designer at Barefoot Graphics, which is a small printing and sign company down here where I'm designing all of their signage and larger printed materials and vehicle wraps and also getting to do a little bit of branding here and there. And unfortunately, just because doing the MA program at MICA was so busy and then with things that kind of being in a transitional period this summer, I haven't really had much time to devote to my personal art practice but I do continue to write down ideas and it's something that I hope to be able to revisit in the near future. Good. Katie what about you with your um, you know your own practice are you making work for yourself? Yeah Um, I recently did a freelance project for one of my friend's friends who just started I guess their business and Mm -hmm. they wanted me to create their logo for it and that was really the first um, like real design um, experience that I've had since I've been home and it was a great opportunity and I really enjoyed it. But since then, since before that and after I've just been kind of brushing up on my skills and um, like watching videos and just practicing um, and that's really it. Okay. That's good. I mean, even writing down ideas and keeping track of things that you want to do is is a step in the right direction. Um, it means that there are just future opportunities and that there there is a future there and that's what we want. Um, art art in general is a long game, you know, like you you have a choice whether you stop doing it or not. Um, and so I, I think it's great that you know you're picking up opportunities, keeping track of ideas, you will find the time. It, like I said, this time is crazy. Um, everything has been disrupted and um, any way that we can keep going in our practice um, is so important. Um, so the last question that I have, and if anyone else out there um, has a question, please enter them into the chat or the Q&A. Um, but what advice would you give to current um, art and design students um, at McDaniel? So I have a couple things that I would say as pieces of advice. And the first of these would be just to remain open to possibilities and don't rule anything out. Because going into my senior year at McDaniel, I would pretty much decided no, I'm done with school. I'm going to go get a job after this. But then over the course of my senior year, I kind of reconsidered and realized that the MA program at MICA was something that made a lot of sense for me and would help me to accomplish my goals. And so, yeah, I guess just keep an open mind. Um, I would say with regards to art, always seek feedback on whatever it is that you're working on. That was a thing that I really enjoyed in my time at MICA was being able to participate in a community of designers and be able to have my work considered from a variety of diverse perspectives and help me think about it in ways that I might not have come up with on my own. And then I guess my last piece of advice would be 
always take advantage of opportunities to attend lectures, meet artists, go to little panel discussions and stuff like that, even if they're not directly art and design related. Yeah. Because that was definitely a thing that I've found throughout my experience, but especially at Micah. I've found that I often get interesting ideas from lectures where I didn't necessarily expect that I would find anything that related to my practice. That's great. Cool. Katie, what about you? So some advice that I would give is one, don't be afraid to go out of your comfort zone. Um, that's something that I really had to do when I was at MICA. And I, a lot of the time I ended up having a project that I really wasn't a hundred percent sold on, but from where I had started on that project, it was really a big uh, shift. And I really had to listen to what uh, my peers were saying. And even if I didn't completely agree with all of it, I just was like, okay, well, maybe I can incorporate um, this idea that they had somehow. Um, and I really pushed myself. And another piece of advice I would say is to trying to figure out how to phrase this <laughs> um that it's okay if you feel it's okay to have a creative block um it's all part of the process and um you're gonna have moments where you're thinking i hate this or this isn't gonna work and um but in the end it'll all work out and I, what i also liked at michael was the feedback and it's always great to get feedback, even if it's um, on one little um, thing, like the type that you use for a sentence. Um, but always, always, always ask for feedback. Um, and my last piece of advice would be to kind of just not let your fears take over. And um, if you're afraid to create a project a certain way then maybe you should just try it out and just see what happens and if you don't like it well at least you try it and maybe you learned a couple of skills um, from trying that uh, that route yeah you were um, when you mentioned the created block there's a, a great book um, by Twyla Tharp who's a dancer and choreographer called the creative habit and she calls that um, part of our practice like ruts and grooves that you're going to hit kind of speed bumps that you might get stuck in sometimes but as long as you keep moving eventually you'll hit a groove um, and I think that's so important. And I wanted to mention one other thing is during my time at MICA I definitely doubted myself a lot especially at the beginning because I was seeing all these my other peers they had so many ideas and they were just coming up with these incredible designs and I really doubted like my abilities but you have to just remind yourself that um, you can design and that you're good at it and um, that you have a purpose for it and um, even if it's hard it's going to be worth it at the end. Yeah and you're there and you're in the arena with them too. So um, uh, Steve asked a question um, and Steve, I can send you, um, Katie made a presentation about this and I can share this with you. Um, but he said, um, could you explain the job fraud? Oh, you're muted. Yeah, so I've had about like five of these now, but oh, no. yeah, it was pretty rough. But the first one I had, uh, it was probably like three or four months ago and so I got this email from a person that it was like for a photography job or like a design job. I'm not exactly, or I don't really remember, but it seemed so legit. They asked um, to do like a Zoom meeting or like a video meeting and to send them like my information. And, um, and so I did that and then the, this was so long ago, but um, they, long story short, 
it ended up being like a text interview. And so I actually had asked Chloe if that was like a legitimate thing because I was thinking, hey, I mean, it's COVID, so maybe that's like a new alternative. Um, but it really was just automated. And so it wasn't real. And, um, and then they had asked me or they had said that they wanted if they could ask for like my bank account to send money that I could purchase all these things. And I was like, okay, this is not like how this interview or this is not how this conversation should be going. And um, what I should have done was look up the person first before all this, because I looked them up and they had been dead since 2014 or 2016. And um, if I had found that out first, then I wouldn't have had that issue. But um, I had another um, fraud issue that was like very similar and um, it was text-based again and all the questions were very similar and um, I like as soon as like as these were happening I kind of started picking apart what wasn't true and how I could tell that these were fake um, but yeah it was definitely hard at first because they're so legitimate like they look so real but when you really pick apart the email you see little errors here and there and then you it clicks that it's not um, a real thing but after a while i um realized that they weren't real after like the third or fourth time and i actually made a joke with my mom that um I was like, hey, I got another job fraud email. And she was like, good job. Like, you know how to do that. Like, you should make that your profession now. And I was like, no, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Going to digital forensics. Yeah. <laughs> or something. Um, any other questions from those attending? Um, Jonathan and Katie, why don't you each, um, if you're comfortable doing so, put your email um, in the chat. Um, in case anyone w wants to reach out. Um, but thank you both so much. Um, I think this has been a really valuable um, conversation. And, um, you know, I'm really proud of you both um, for going, um, you know, for pursuing the program and then um, keeping, keep going, kept going um, when everything happened. And, um, you know, I, I can't imagine how um, disruptive that must have felt and especially with gearing towards this in-person culminating experience um, that's part of the MICA experience um, you know that, that's tough so I'm happy that we were able to give you a chance to um, share your work um, with a another audience cool anything else um, that either of you would like to say to the group I just want to thank everybody for coming out and listening to what we had to say. And thank you, Chloe, for um, holding this for Jonathan and I. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming and uh, thanks for putting this together. You're very welcome. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Have a good night. <laughs>